Every year, the Mercer Human Resources uh, consultant consulting company issues a survey, the results of a survey of the most livable cities in the world. They have employees all over the world, and they do all this research to advise international companies of where are the best cities to locate, what is the cost of living difference in, from city to city, so that cost of living allowances can be given to various employees to equalize their real purchasing power and so on. And it was very interesting, the list of 50 cities, this uh, was came out last March, and it was their survey for the year 2003. They'll probably have another one in a couple of months. And of the four most livable cities in the world, which are Zurich, Geneva, Vancouver, and Vienna, I happen to have close connections with three of them. I lived for six years in Zurich. I do not have much to do with Geneva. I've been there a few times. did not like it nearly as much as Zurich because Geneva is a very modern city, while Zurich is a very old world city with beautiful, beautiful architecture. And then the third city is Vancouver, where I lived for five years, and the fourth city is Vienna, which I consider my spiritual and cultural home, although I've only been there about three times because of the beautiful Viennese music, the German operetta and all the wonderful things that have come out of Vienna culturally. But the reason I bring this up is I thought you might be interested in knowing which U.S. cities appeared on this. Now, this survey took into consideration all kinds of things, the health facilities, the cleanliness of the city, the job opportunities, the uh, cost of living, all of these different things to try to determine which city had the best quality of life. And, and, and they call the survey the overall quality of living rankings. And the highest city was Honolulu, which came in 24th worldwide, but was first among the U.S. cities. And very closely behind it was San Francisco. Further down the list came, of all places, New York, the last place in the world I would want to live. Uh, sorry for you folks in New York, but it's just not my style. Then right behind it, Boston, which is a beautiful city, but has horrendous, horrendous traffic problems, mainly because of that great federal project, the Big Dig, but also, like Los Angeles, it seems to take forever to get any place. Then behind Boston comes Portland, Oregon, a city I've always been kind of sympathetic toward, although I haven't spent a lot of time there. And then strangely enough, right behind Portland comes Winston-Salem, North Carolina, which is right next door to where some of my in-laws live in Kernersville, North Carolina. But Winston-Salem is, according to this, the sixth most, most livable city in the United States. And then seventh is Lexington, Kentucky, and eighth, Pittsburgh, ninth, Seattle, that should make Fraser happy. And 10th, Chicago, which also surprises me that it's on there. Those are the 10 cities in the United States which wound up uh, among the 50 most livable cities in the world. And just uh, to give you a little bit more, the ones that came behind the top four, the top four again, Zurich, Geneva, Vancouver, and Vienna. And incidentally, Vancouver is a just breathtakingly beautiful city. And I really enjoyed my five years there. And behind those top four, Auckland, New Zealand, Bern, Switzerland, which is a very pretty city, Copenhagen, uh, Denmark, Frankfurt, Germany, Sydney, Australia, Amsterdam in the Netherlands, Munich, Germany, Brussels, Belgium, Dusseldorf, Germany, Melbourne, Australia, Berlin, Germany, Luxembourg in Luxembourg, Stockholm, Sweden, Toronto, Canada, Wellington, New Zealand. As you can see, the list is pretty much dominated by Western European countries. But I bring this up because several times it's arisen uh, from callers on the show about other places in the world to live. Now, they're not taking into consideration there very much the level of government intrusions and a lot of things that might be of interest to you, but might also help if you're going to travel. Well, you know, they had a big row in Fallujah last month in Iraq, and it is very, very interesting that what was done in Fallujah, which was to destroy about three-quarters of the city, was wished for almost a year ago, actually nine months ago, by Joseph Farrar, uh, conservative, who is the publisher of World Net Daily, the big Internet news site. And Farrar wrote a column on April 6th of last year called Pound Fallujah. And in it he said the U.S. should pound Fallujah like it has never been pounded before. We should not try to gain an international consensus for this action. We should not apologize for it. We should not restrain our Air Force and our artillery batteries from wreaking devastation. We should not expose our ground troops to unnecessary risks. In other words, we may need to flatten Fallujah. We may need to destroy it. We may need to grind it, pulverize it, and salt the soil, as the Romans did with troublesome enemies. Quite frankly, we need to make an example out of Fallujah. Here's a chance for justice. Here's an, an opportunity to show the people of the Middle East it doesn't pay to resort to barbarism and terrorism. Just a few final excerpts. He said, it's time to take off the velvet gloves. It's time to stop being Mr. Nice Guy. It's time to cease worrying about collateral damage. It's time to show all Iraqis and their brothers and sisters throughout the Middle East that it doesn't pay to mess with Americans. 
They need to see there is no profit in it. They need to understand we mean business. They need to accept things will never be the same in Iraq. They need to feel the heat. They need to be provided with visible disincentives to further attacks on Americans, free Iraqis, and other coalition partners. Sometimes the most merciful course of action seems like the harshest. Fallujah needs to feel some pain. If this operation is carried out well and with finality, it can save many more Iraqis, Americans, and others from future pain. Well, it's an old story. How many times have we heard since 9-11 that the only thing these people understand is force? That they've got to show that we can't be messed with. They've got to see that we can't be messed with. That you cannot deal with these people. They're, the only thing that they understand is force. And on and on and on. We've heard it over and over and over again. Well, I'm here to tell you that I don't believe force accomplishes anything. All that force does is to inspire your enemies to use more force on you. Can you not imagine that every time you say we've got to apply more force, that in reply they think to themselves, the only thing we understand, these people, the Americans understand this force, we're going to have to teach them a lesson. And this has been true of the Israeli-Palestinian fights, the English-Northern Ireland fights. I mean, every single one of these feuds around the world, it's been an escalation of force. That every time one side is going to teach the other side a lesson, all it does is make the other side matter and more determined to teach the first side a lesson. Force does not work. Force does not work in any area of our lives. It just simply is never the answer. Now, of course, you have to defend yourself if somebody comes up and starts swinging at you, if somebody tries to break into your house, if somebody tries to attack you directly, that's one thing to defend yourself. But then to go say you're going to teach their brothers and sisters a lesson never to do this again, you're on the wrong track. You try to do that, and the brothers and sisters are then going to teach you a lesson. And on and on and on it goes. Force is not the answer. And when you think people are crazy for wanting to imagine a world with no government, because government is nothing but initia initiation of force. Government is, every government program involves force, forcing people to pay for something they don't want to pay for, or to do something they don't want to do, or to refrain from doing what they want to do, refrain by force. Every government program is force. And when you think that somebody is crazy for trying to imagine a country, a society, a city, a state, whatever, without government, all they are trying to do is imagine a society without force, without the initiation of force, where the only force that's ever used is to defend oneself, where somehow it can be worked out that we can defend ourselves and we can protect ourselves better without initiating force against somebody in order to do it. Because the police department that we have today, the army that we have today, all the trappings of security that we have today are financed by force, by people being uh, forced to pay for these things, sometimes even forcibly inducted into the service, so-called service, and it's all done by force, even if the people who are being forced don't agree that it's being done well, don't agree that it's accomplishing anything at all, or even think that this is making things worse. The people who are the objects of police brutality are paying for the brutality that is inflicted upon them. The people who are wrongly convicted in courts are paying for the very courts that are wrongly convicting them. So what is so crazy about trying to imagine a society that doesn't have this force, where people only do what they are willing to volunteer to do, only engage in commerce that they want to engage in, only pay for the things that they want to pay for, and where everybody faces the consequences of his own acts instead of continually having to face the consequences of some politician's acts. Now, I'm not advocating that we abolish government tomorrow because it doesn't make any difference what I advocate. Leonard Reed once wrote an article where he talked about the famous libertarian Albert J. Nock, a, a great libertarian of the 30s and 40s, wrote a book called The Memoirs of a Superfluous Man, Gosh, I can't think of the name of his classic. It may come to me later. But Leonard Reed once asked Albert J. Nock, he said, you're a libertarian, you're this, you're that. I can't understand why you advocate a single tax, which was the Henry George plan to just tax property and nothing else. And Nock's reply was, I don't advocate it. I just believe in it. And this is what I'm trying to say now, is that I'm not advocating that we do away with all government tomorrow. I just believe in my own heart that it would be a better world, or at least a better society in which to live, if we had no government, if we could find a way to get along without government. And in the meantime, wherever we can eliminate force in human relations, I am all for it. If we can get rid of the income tax, I'm all for it. If we can get rid of the drug war, I'm all for it. If we could quit the foreign adventures invading other countries around the world, I'm all for it. If we could get rid of the gun laws, I'm all for it. If we could get rid of the property taxes, the sales taxes, I'm all for it. Do you get my point? It doesn't matter whether we believe that there's some way or some way might be discovered that we could get along without any government at all, or whether we believe in a limited government governed by the Constitution, or whether we just believe that government ought to be cut in half. 
If we believe that we want smaller government than we have now, we are all on the same side, and we will go just as far as we can make it work. And every step that we take in that direction will make our lives better. So we're all in this together, folks. We shouldn't be sniping at each other. We should be doing everything we can to minimize force in human relationships. Let's go right now to JP in Florida. Good evening, JP. Hey, Harry. How are you doing? It's always a pleasure to talk to you. I haven't talked to you in a little while. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to talk with you. What's on your mind tonight? Well, it's funny that you mentioned that article uh, by uh, Joseph R. I, I remember reading it after you mentioned it. Um, and keeping in line with that, actually, um, there's a great article uh, on LouRockwell.com where he mentions people like him have pretty much bastardized the conservative party, and, and he calls them now uh, red state fascists. Um, and what he means by that is the sense that, you know, he calls them fascists. I mean, he says, why fascist? Because it's not leftist in the sense of egalitarian. It's no real deep with business. Uh, but it, it falls into just life as America's only family, faith, and flag. So it's these states as a central organizing principle of society. So what, what ends up happening is, is that just with, with Bush coming in, it, that, that ideology has turned into a, a, a defense of Bush no matter what he does, and it's almost blind to uh, whatever it is he does. And he compares it to um, always calling him, and I hear this a lot with conservatives and with, with Republicans nowadays, I mean, just calling him our leader, our leader, our leader. And he, call, he compares them to brown shirts and that they're in Nazi Germany. Yes, uh, if, I, if I can interrupt you before you get to another point, uh, it's just struck me so much last year, so often, Bush himself used the terms, I want to lead the country this way or that way. Uh, leading the country, it's, it's my job to lead the country. I think I can lead the country better than John Kerry can. And on and on, and he himself over and over used the expression that he was our leader and so forth. And you know what the word leader is in German? That was my next point, Fuhrer. Okay, yes. That was, yeah. You took it right out of my mouth. It's Der Fuhrer, Fuhrer right. And yeah. we all know what the, the <laughs> connotation of that is. Right, right. <laughs> and, and it's so funny that you say that because, you know, in this, in this very article, uh, there's, there's actually a word uh, for that called uh, Fuhrer Princip, which is the, the principle that the, that, that the leader has the absolute say in everything, and to question him is, is a sign of treason. Yes, and, and, and that article that you're referring to is on my Radio Links page because I, re I referred to it last week, although I didn't go into much detail about it. A uh, great article, yeah, absolutely. And he says, you know, Know, again, like brown shirts, the new conservatives take personally any criticism of their leader and his policies. To be a critic is to be an enemy, and, and I, I, I haven't seen that in a long time. And you know, he mentions that uh, it's, and it's, it's people like the Safara and, and the Sean Hannitys, and, and they perpetrate this in America, and it, it completely goes against what conservatives were supposed to be about, which is which is uh, more of a laissez-faire attitude as far as government getting out of people's lives. Well, there's an enormous difference between conservatives as an opposition party and conservatives as the majority party. When the conservatives were the opposition party, they were talking about smaller government, they were talking about uh, limiting what leaders could do, about restricting the activities of the president, you know, on and on and on, and all of that's been thrown out the window now that they're the ruling party. And one other point I just have to make, you referred to brown shirts two or three times. There is no E on the end of brown in brown shirts. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> one last question I have for you is, um, you know, when Janet Reno was, uh, was Attorney General, I just I, I joined, you know, other conservatives in, in wondering how somebody uh, like that could ever. I mean, I, I, I definitely thought that she was taking us into that police state uh, territory, um, and then I never thought anybody could be worse until John Ashcroft came along. And then when John Ashcroft came along, I never thought anybody could be worse. And then when I, when I, when I found out that he was resigning, I was ecstatic, only to find out that Gonzalez is even worse. Right. Here is a man that, in the, you know, Congress passed laws against war crimes for, uh, for the United States to, to, to not participate in war crimes. So in, it really, in, in the, the present administration can be constituted as actually being guilty of war crimes if you really look deep into it. What Gonzalez ended up doing in this infamous memo is just saying, hey, wait a second, these, these terrorists don't count. Yes. So you can't you can't uh, hold uh, the administration accountable if we if what if we detain them indefinitely and they're actually proposing building huge prisons uh, to hold terrorists for the rest of their lives now. Right, they, they are automatically sentenced to life imprisonment just because they were captured. Right, and they're they're proposing they're actually going to build uh, they're they're already putting twenty five million towards building indefinite prisons for people who will never get a trial. Uh, who, will, who will never be accused of a crime, but simply they were just labeled terrorists, and there you go. And Gonzalez is somebody who actually, and, and again, just because he's labeled a Republican or, 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 is, or is appointed by Bush. Because he's he makes, not a Democrat. Is exactly, the, because he's not a Democrat, they make excuse after excuse after excuse, and it's getting to the point where we even try to talk ourselves into being as a, a torture being an okay thing. As right, because as he said they would apply, he believed that the Geneva Convention should be strictly adhered to, but that terrorists were not covered by the Geneva Convention. Therefore, right. anything goes with terrorists. And one of the things that Bob me. I read some of Gonzalez's prepared testimony before the confirmation hearings, and also some of the questioning, and I saw some of it on television, and whatever was referred to about torture was from the standpoint that it is not humane to torture somebody, no matter who he is, no matter how guilty he is, and so forth. But what was missed in the whole
whole thing is that they were torturing people who have never had a trial so they could just as easily have been torturing innocent people and that's the thing that never got brought out is that these people you don't know that they're terrorists you say the Bill of Rights doesn't apply to terrorists anything goes with terrorists and so on but you don't know that this person is a terrorist because he's never had a chance to confront his accusers he's never had access to an attorney he has never been able to give his side of the story before an impartial neutral uh, court of a jury of his peers or in, uh, an impartial judge so you don't know that this person is a terrorist and any information you get from him through torture may be lies just to make you stop the torture just say anything right. to get them right. to stop well torture, it, torture is very ineffective absolutely and I, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in I, I believe it was Maslow who came, who came up with the idea of cognitive dissonance I believe every single one of us carries around the cognitive dissonance and, and, it, and it comes into play uh, every time we feel that we're supporting or doing something uh, terrible um, so fact, I, that, that has been proven to be wrong or have been proven to be contrary to our principles. Exactly. So we'll talk ourselves out of it. And I think what people do in order to justify supporting torture is they'll try to say something like, uh, you know, some of the prisoners are ruthless terrorists with blood of Americans on their hands. So right. it's okay to torture them. And it's, thank goodness we don't have Clinton as president. Uh, <laughs> right. Thanks so much, JP. I appreciate your call. And we're going to talk now with Kayleen in Massachusetts. Good evening, Kayleen. Sorry to keep you waiting. That's all right. Good evening, my esteemed Mr. Brown. Thank you. It's been a while since we've spoken uh, on the phone. You're supposed to call me your leader. <laughs> <laughs> I would love for you to be my leader if I had a leader. <laughs> well, well uh, first thing i do is resign. <laughs> That's because you're such a great man. The responsibility would be too great. <laughs> so what's up tonight? I want to make a couple of points. First of all, at the beginning of your show, you were talking about uh, force, and I, I, I think I off track about uh, 16 times that you said the word force, and um, I absolutely agree with everything you said, um, but speaking of the word force, um, I'm sure you've heard of um, Freedom Force uh, International. Freedom Force International. I, offhand, it doesn't ring a bell. Well, it's an international libertarian organization, and they have a website, and uh, they actually have a written creed. It was started in uh, 2002. I can't remember the name of the gentleman who started it, but um, the website is www.freedom-force.org. And I read the website. It's a wonderful website. It's uh, actually in nine countries worldwide right now, and probably spreading. And um, it's just it, your your listeners really should go to that. I'll actually email you the, the website, uh, the address of the website later on. Well, I wrote, um, it, I wrote it down, so I'll go take a look at it at the news break. It's a wonderful website. Uh, also, talking about the uh, most livable cities, I happen to work in Boston, mm -hmm. as you may know, because I've spoken to you before about that. But you I don't live in Boston. You though. live in New Hampshire, don't you? No, I live in I live in Massachusetts, but I live about an hour south of Boston. Oh. And um, so, <laughs> when you're talking about Boston, Boston is a beautiful city. It if is. I were to live in any city, and I've been to many of them, Boston would probably be the one. Uh, but um, as for the traffic problem, oh, you're not kidding. And um, as for the big dig, biggest waste of taxpayer money in history. What is the current status of the big dig? I haven't heard anything about it in a long the time. The current status is um, both tunnels, both ways, are finished. In other words, there's a 2.5-mile tunnel, which goes through the downtown area, uh, on uh, Interstate 93, north and south, which makes you miss all of the beautiful cityscapes. The only good thing that came of it whatsoever was the uh, Bacon Bridge, which is at the north end of the tunnel. And it is the most beautiful bridge. It's absolutely awesome. It's, it's, it's a work of art. Um, but the project was uh, supposed to cost $1.5 billion. It ended up costing over $24 billion. Oh, my God. And it is still screwed up because I just read in newspapers a few weeks ago they found leaks that they're going to have to spend millions of dollars fixing. And how long did it take? Ten years. Ten years? Ten years. And what, ten was, what was the original estimate? Do you uh, know? Five years. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. Five years. It, and it's still continuing because they're still fixing stuff. But, still, it's, uh, but, but it's, actually being it's actually being used now? Oh, yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, it's a 2.5 mile tunnel going both ways, uh, three lanes each way, which was supposed to have streamlined traffic which does not whatsoever because it's a speed limit is 45 miles per hour. There's no um, no vehicles allowed that ca uh, carry hazardous waste or hazardous cargo of any kind uh, because the tunnel is so dangerous in that sort of way. Uh, it's just it's well, incredible. Well, that means any, any vehicle that has gasoline in it. <laughs> well, yeah, but it actually it means any, like, 18-wheeler uh, carrying gasoline or, sure. no, I, I understand. or you know, anything like that. Uh, uh, it's just a ridiculous waste of taxpayer money. Oh, yeah. The most ridiculous waste of taxpayer money imaginable. And any project like that is just a ridiculous waste of money. But it, this is just the biggest waste of taxpayer money I can even believe. It, it, it's insane. You go through the tunnel, and you miss the beautiful the beautiful cityscape, and it, it's insane. It's just the biggest waste of money. I, I can't even believe that I, anybody would have approved this. 
I, I think I think we got the point, Katie. <laughs> you didn't like it. Anyway. And, and uh, I used the word for 16 times. I think you said it's the biggest waste said. of taxpayers' and money 16 <laughs> times. So. You made a wonderful point. You made a wonderful point. Um, but Boston is a beautiful city. Yes, it's it a is. a very beautiful city. And, uh, it, and as far as big cities go, it has a relatively low uh, violent uh, crime rate. So, um, like I said, if I were living in any big city, it would probably be Boston. Well, that's good. That's good. But, um, all right. Well, thanks so much for your right, call. Thank you. And let's now talk with James in Oregon. Good evening, James. Good evening, Eric. What's up? Oh, uh, well, I originally called in to uh, uh, talk about uh, an issue we talked about a long time ago. Uh, you dropped it sort of like a bomb. You said, matter, uh, matter of fact, uh, as I recall, uh, you, d- you didn't think fraud should be illegal. And um, I thought about that a little while, and I just, uh, you said at the time we could talk about it uh, some other time. Well, um, this is some other time, huh? Yeah, pretty much. The thing that occurred to me is that. Um, Fraud and consent have a, a, a relationship. Um, fraud erodes consent. In fact, consent really doesn't happen if fraud is is uh, active or uh, is, is being played out. You, you see what I'm saying? A person's consent is destroyed when he's defrauded. Well, I understand that he's not getting what he expected, and so he's not getting what he consented to. So his consent necessarily uh, really doesn't exist, or at least exists in such a weakened state that it's that it's, uh, you know, eroded past the point of usefulness. Um, the, the point I'm trying to make is that if you believe that in a consensual society, a society where all activities are consensual, essentially, at least all, all activities that involve more than one person are consensual, then how could fraud not be illegal? Because, you, I mean, let's say you, you suffer harm. You go to court, first thing he's saying is, well, did you agree to it? Well, the guy lied to me, so I agreed with a fiction. Well, so let's suppose that you ask for somebody to fix something in your house, and he says, I'll do this, and you give me $100, and I'll do it. You give him $100, and he does it, and he doesn't do it really up to the uh, satisfaction that you expected, that it's just not a very good job. Or well, you'd, you'd, want, you'd want your $100 back, right? Um, yes. Well, what, di- what difference would it make whether he defrauded you or he was just incompetent? You, the result is the same in either case. Uh what if he didn't do the job at all? What if he just took your 100 bucks and threw a pack of hammers at your house? Well, suppose he took the $100 and his truck broke down and he never was able to get back to your house because of that. It, it doesn't matter. You're not getting what you wanted, and that's the important part of it, is that you're not getting what you wanted, and the intentions and the motives of the, the person that you dealt with are really unimportant. All you want to do is to get satisfaction for it. And uh, when we open the door to questions of fraud, we open our, the door to a, a great big can of worms. And my point is that if somebody does not deliver on what you uh, thought you were going to get, then it really doesn't matter whether he did this intentionally, he did it out of incompetence, or he did it because a uh, natural disaster interfered or whatever it may be, you want satisfaction. You want to resolve the issue. And when you try to prosecute fraud, you are trying to prosecute what went on in somebody's mind. You are trying to divine what happened in somebody's mind. And if somebody says, I didn't do this intentionally, I uh, was unfortunately affected by circumstances beyond my control, then you have to decide whether he's telling the truth or lying, and that can be very, very difficult in a situation like that. I just see the whole thing as being pointless to try to figure out what the motive was. Um, uh, Okay, Um, I see one or two flaws with that argument, one of them being that you can hurt and or kill uh, one and or more people using nothing more than fraud. Um, if, for instance, you give me $5 to pick up some medication at the drugstore for, for you, and I come back and I know it's the wrong medication, but it was cheaper, and I give it to you, and it kills you. I haven't, I haven't committed any physical violence against you. I've committed essentially fraud because I've, uh, I've defrauded you. I've, said, I've given you something in a transaction that kills you. Well, uh, let's let's say that there were no laws against fraud whatsoever. Well, that, that was going to be my next point. Then okay. fraud would become very big business. Of course, of course, that is the impression that we have, and it may be so for a few days or a week or two weeks, maybe even a month, but I can kind of doubt that it could last longer than that, because what would happen is that if somebody gave you $5 to go to the pharmacy and to pick up something, you wouldn't do it because you would feel, ah, gosh, I mean, fraud is rampant. There's a, no way I'm going to take a chance on this. Uh, I could get killed and so on. And people would refuse to deal with anybody. And so what would the next step be? And the next step would be that the honest merchants, the people who are not engaging in fraud, would have to find a way to prove their honesty. And there would be all kinds of other people who would recognize this as an opportunity to make a huge profit and would say, hey, hey, I've got a way by which I can, uh, by which you can guarantee to your customers that they're not going to get 
get hurt from dealing with you, and here's how to do it, and you pay me, and I'll do it, so forth, so forth, so forth. And once the honest merchants had a way of guaranteeing their honesty, the dishonest people would be out of business because nobody would deal with anybody who couldn't guarantee his honesty. And somebody else may not be able to guarantee his honesty, and you wouldn't know maybe he really is honest, but why take a chance when right next door to him is, a, is an honest merchant who's guaranteeing his honesty through uh, an insurance plan or through some other way that we can't even think of now because there's no need to worry about it, so we don't even uh, try to devise such plans. But the point being that whatever the problem is in a free society, somebody's going to recognize that as a way of making a profit by solving the problem. And instead, if we turn to government to do it, then what we're doing is asking for a political solution to what is a social problem. And it's just as bad as turning to government to try to outlaw drugs. It's just as bad to turn to government to try to decide who can own a gun and who can't own a gun. It's just as bad as turning to government to try to bring democracy to Iraq. Uh, okay. Um, if you mentioned the word force uh, before. Um, do you believe that it's possible for one human being to harm another using force? Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, that should be illegal, right? Well, illegal in the sense that whatever social system we have would recognize this as something that shouldn't be done. We're, we're trying to eliminate the initiation of force. Uh, in whatever way we can, either by finding a way of having a government uh, that really does, in some satisfactorily efficient way, eliminate the initiation of force, or in a society without government that has some other way of guaranteeing that there's no initiation of force. Uh, is that a guess? <laughs> well, we're, we're recognizing force as being a, a bad thing that we have to take uh, institutional organized steps to eliminate, as opposed to things like taking organized institutional steps to eliminate inefficiency or fraud or dishonesty or adultery or bad language or well, any of the thing. things. Uh, it's for, if I uh, wanted to kill you, for example, um, I could much e I, I could kill you a lot easier using fraud than physical violence. Well, you could. So if I if I could kill you, if if, it's, if it should be legal that I kill you using physical violence, why should it not be equally illegal to kill you using fraud? Well, you, if you killed me through incompetence, no you, wait a second, if you killed me through incompetence, you would, in, in any kind of judicial society, be held responsible for that. Uh, it's called involuntary manslaughter, and the difference between involuntary manslaughter and voluntary manslaughter is not very great. And the point being that you would be held responsible for it, and it wouldn't matter what your motives were, you killed me. And all the people who depend upon me for their livelihood would have a case against you for having inflicted physical damage upon me. Okay. And, and that's understood. Well, what if I made an agreement with somebody and that person died, but I had his full consent? He knew the consequences. He knew that he might die. If there were prevalence of that, then people would stop making agreements with other people until somebody could come along and guarantee that it would be honest. But understand here, James, and everybody else who's listening to this, right now we're arguing over how many angels can dance on the head of a pin well, because we're not discussing something that has has immediate relevance to what should be the next step in trying to make this a freer country and to obtain more liberty from government uh, than we have now. We're talking about what might be the case in an ideal society. And look, the reason I mention it all, Harry, is, is I want to bounce off you the, this outrageous idea that I had that, that all crimes can, in fact, be viewed as a type of fraud. Because if you secure the consent of a person, if he understands that he the, the consequences of engaging in whatever activity it is, there's no crime. But if you haven't con acquired his consent, then it is a crime if he gets harmed. So mm. all I'm saying is that all laws are basically laws against one person harming one person or institution harming a person, harming another person using either force or fraud. Um, but I see we're out of time, so <laughs> and it's your show, and I don't want to take it up. All right, James, thank you for calling. And uh, before I get to the email, there was one thing I had meant to mention in the last hour when I was talking about the quality of living survey by Mercer Resources. Uh, whoever they are, <laughs> First are Human Resources Consulting, um, and their list of the top cities. They actually survey two, about 230 cities in the world, and Baghdad used to be relatively high on the list before 1990, and now it is dead last. And that is what has happened as a result of U.N. sanctions, which really were U.S. and British sanctions all through the 1990s, and then the war in Iraq, of course, which has made the place completely unlivable. And I will talk about that if we have time a little bit later in the show. I don't think most people in America and perhaps even most people listening to the show realize just how bad conditions are in Iraq, and it isn't just the resistors who are creating problems with their car bombs and so forth. It's the U.S. military as well. But let's take some of these emails first. David in Minneapolis says, 
in response to what we were saying before in the last hour about the fact that um, we have to be just as worried about the right wing as we are about the left wing, uh, that whoever gets power is going to create trouble for us. And he says, when Clinton and Reno were in charge, the conservatives all said, I love my country but fear my government. Now that the originators of that motto have their leaders in charge, they seem to have forgotten that people who criticize the government are not necessarily anti-American. Yes, liberals, libertarians, and others can love their country and hate what their government is doing, whether it's here at home or in Iraq. Justin in cyberspace uh, says, here's a book you recommended to those wanting to move overseas, way back in your book, The Guide to Swiss Banks. And the book that you recommended was I've Had It by Robert Hopkins. Yes, I remember that book. I haven't looked at it in, gosh, close to 30 years now, so I can't really remember all that was in it, but it was a book about people who had decided they no longer wanted to live in the United States and how to find a place around the world that suited you and what you would be up against and so forth. And you probably could find a used copy of that book on Amazon. And anyway, if you're interested in this book, it's called I've Had It, and the author is Robert Hopkins, and it's a book about finding a place to live in another country. Mario, out in cyberspace, has two questions. One, he said, a person called the show about a half hour before you came on the air tonight, and he told our host that there was some kind of law passed in 1868 that allows American citizens to renounce their citizenship and avoid having to pay taxes. Well, all I can tell you is if there's such a law, it is being ignored. The practice of the Internal Revenue Service is to treat you thusly. First of all, if you are an American citizen, it doesn't matter where you live in the world. You could live in the wilds of Africa. You could be living on an island in Indonesia. Wherever it is, there's an IRS office around the corner, and they're going to make sure that you pay your taxes, and you're going to continue to pay your taxes. And if you are 50 years outside the United States, as long as you're still an American citizen, you will be subject to American taxes. And the United States is about the only country in the Western world, the only developed country, that forces you to pay taxes on money you earn outside the United States. If you're a Canadian citizen, for instance, and you go to live in the United States, you don't pay Canadian taxes as long as you're living in the United States and earning your living there. If you're a United States citizen and you go to live in Canada, you're paying taxes to both Canada and the United States. Now, if you renounce your citizenship, then the IRS will examine your case. And if they conclude that you have renounced your citizenship specifically to avoid paying taxes, guess what? They'll come to the conclusion that you still owe them taxes. And I can bet that in 9 out of 10 cases, they come to the conclusion that's, that that's exactly why you renounce your citizenship. And, of course, if you continue living in the United States, you're sure to pay taxes either way. And his second question was, he said, I read the news this morning online that the United Nations peacekeepers that are in Tusami-affected areas supposed to be bringing food and aid to the hungry, devastated people, are committing horrible crimes against the poor people. Rapes of women and children are very common. Many times these acts take place because the U.N. personnel withhold food and won't give them unless they submit to these horrible actions. I'm sure any time you have large numbers of soldiers or other people sent by the government to do their duty, they sometimes act unruly, almost like they resent being sent there by force. The U.N. is nothing more than a huge international welfare scam, and I believe that humanitarian aid can be better served by the private sector. Why is it that any time government becomes involved in any effort, the exact opposite always happens? Well, I haven't heard anything about the crimes committed by people over there, although you can well imagine that certainly there would be widespread looting in a situation like that, but not necessarily by the people bringing the relief uh, the food and medicines and so forth. But with regard to why do government programs turn out to be the opposite, it is, I believe, basically, if you want to sum it up in one line, it is because the people involved are not held accountable for the consequences of their acts. And any time that situation exists, you are laying the door wide open for abuse, for corruption, for injustice, for all sorts of things. And it isn't just that good people turn bad under those circumstances, but you are creating a situation that acts as a magnet for bad people. When you have a situation where people can get away with things because they're not held accountable for it, sooner or later the bad people in the world hear about this sort of thing, and they move to it like they are magnetized, uh, and they are just drawn to it because this is a perfect opportunity to do what they've been wanting to do without any chance that they're going to have to stand trial for it, that they're going to have to reimburse somebody for the mistakes or the bad judgment that they make or the bad faith that they may engage in. And that's why you have a situation like this. And you are going to find that people who like violence and who like rough situations and so forth are going to, for instance, be drawn to the military. 
uh, to the police in many cases. This is not to say that all policemen are bad or that all soldiers are bad people. Uh, far from it. Obviously far from it. Because people have varying motives for it. But we should also recognize that there are going to be people that are going to be drawn to these things. Thus, you are going to have police corruption. You're going to have police brutality. You are going to have atrocities committed in wartime. And when a government or a sympathizer with a government says, well, Yes, there have been problems like Abu Ghraib uh, prison, that these things have existed, but this is far different from what happened under Saddam Hussein in Iraq, because there they were bad guys that, that uh, ordered these things to happen. And certainly, uh, President Bush wouldn't condone this sort of thing, and he's spoken out against it and so forth. But what you have to realize is, as James Burnham, I believe it was, once said, he who asks for A must expect B, that there are certain consequences that come with certain acts. And when you create a war and you send the people over there to fight that war, you are going to have atrocities. And the atrocities are going to occur on both sides. And it doesn't matter whether they are the evil people of the Iraqi Republican Guard or those wonderful, clean-cut American boys. The atrocities are going to happen on both sides because that is the nature of war. And he who declares war declares atrocities. He who sends people overseas to fight in a 110-degree desert is just asking for trouble. Because under those circumstances, the atrocities are going to be even worse. He who tries to pacify a foreign country is asking for atrocities in spades because the people that he sends over there are going to be subject to be shot by people posing as civilians. They are being put in the most dangerous circumstances possible, and so they are going to become not just trigger-happy, shooting at anything that moves and then turns out to be an eight-year-old boy, but also they are going to become so frustrated and they are going to become so angry and so fearful and so hating of the enemy there that when they get their hands on the enemy, they are not easily going to be restrained from committing atrocities against them. Thus, there were all kinds of atrocities on both sides in World War II. There were atrocities in the Gulf War. There were atrocities in the Korean War, in the First World War, and there are atrocities in this war in Iraq, and they are happening on both sides. And any time... You put people in that situation, and I wish I had the quote handy, but it was either Eugene Sledge or Paul Fussell who said something like, any time you put dangerous weapons in the hands of scared little boys, you're going to be asking for trouble. And that's what happens. And you may say, well, our reservists, our military people, our soldiers, our Marines, and so forth, these aren't scared little boys. Well, you only saw them when they were in the United States and they were far from the battle lines. But once they get over there and they realize that the enemy can be in front of them, behind them, to the sides of them, could be anywhere, and that they could be killed at any moment or maimed, or they have seen people whose legs were shot off or who were maimed for life, uh, they do become scared little boys. Not all of them, but a great many of them. And he who wills A gets B and has to accept B. And he who started this war has to take responsibility for all the torture, all the prisoner abuse, all the atrocities that take place. And incidentally, those atrocities go far beyond Abu Ghraib prison. There is a devastating article that appeared on LouRockwell.com this weekend, and I have linked to it on the Radio Links page. And since we're about to take a break, I will just take the time to tell you about the Radio Links page. If you go to my website, harrybrown.org, right at the top of the homepage, you can see a place to click on the Radio Links page, and you will go to a page that has articles and websites mentioned on the broadcast. And for tonight's broadcast, there are several articles listed, one of which is Iraq, the Devastation. And that's what I'm going to talk about when we come back. But you can read the full article, and I think that it's important to read it if you want to understand exactly what's going on in Iraq. Also, I got a, an email from Robert in cyberspace. I just donated some money to the Red Cross for the Tusami disaster. If I wasn't paying so much in taxes, I would give more. And be, again, before we go to the phone, I mentioned this article, Iraq, the Devastation. Uh, by, it's by... Well, it's by two people, one of whom is Dar Jamel. And I won't have time to go into it, but I do suggest you go to the uh, website, harrybrown.org, and to the radio links page, and click on that and read the article. It is so different from what is being told to us on the news, and we keep hearing, why isn't the media providing good news about Iraq? Why aren't they talking about all the good things that our soldiers are doing over there and so on? Well, the fellow who wrote this uh, spent seven months of the last year in Iraq, and he traveled all around the country and talked with various different people. And he heard stories of brutality, uh, people being arrested uh, and not charged with anything, taken in and interrogated forcibly, brutally, in order to try to get information on the resistance, uh, the terrible, terrible conditions, the lack of electricity and so forth. And they keep telling us, they, uh, you hear things like, oh, is that wonderful, we built this, we restored this school, or we brought electricity to this area for the first time, people who had never had it before. 
Folks, Iraq was usually considered before 1990 to be the most advanced country in the Middle East. It had the best medical facilities. It had the most advanced educational facilities. It was a country, it was a country and especially Baghdad as a city, were considered the most highly developed places in the Middle East. Electricity is not new to those places. Food isn't new to those places. What is new, perhaps, is that they are getting a few little dribbles of things after 14 long years of deprivation during which the U.S. and British military enforced a blockade that kept food, medicines, and money out of Iraq. And when you hear about this corruption in the Oil for Food uh, program, that was part of uh, the Iraq thing during the last 12, well, now it's 14 years, and uh, you heard about it on the news at the top of the hour about Kofi Annan's son being implicated and this, that, and the other thing, they have to remember that the only reason that oil for food program even existed was because the U.S. and Britain were blockading Iraq and keeping Iraq from doing business with anybody. So then the, the sanctions were creating so many problems there and killing so many men, women, and children in Iraq that they finally allowed them to sell some oil to the outside world as long as the proceeds were used for food only. Well, guess what? A lot of the money got diverted to things other than food. Why wouldn't it? Why wouldn't it be a prime uh, source of corruption? Why wouldn't it be a situation where everybody connected would be trying to break the rules and divert that money to things that were needed in Iraq in exchange for a price? Imagine if you were in the U.N. and you controlled this pot of money and controlled this opportunity. Uh, wouldn't you, not controlling the pot of money, but controlling access to the outside world for the Iraqis, wouldn't you perhaps offer them, yes, we'll let you get some money in, we'll let you be able to buy some things that you need, but boy, you're going to have to grease my palm to do it. Yes, these things happen. And any time you set up a situation like that, you're asking for trouble. All right, let's uh, get back to reality and talk with Al in New Mexico. Good evening, Al. I'm sorry to keep you waiting. That's okay, Harry. You're the greatest. Thank you. Um, I had a question for you, as well, a little bit of changing gears, but I had a question about the proposed uh, nationalized sales tax, mm -hmm. uh, fair tax. Yes. And I've heard a lot of other fiscal conservatives really sing its praises, and I think it's a step in the right direction, but you seem at best lukewarm on it, and I've heard that uh, Ron Paul does not support it. Yes, um, uh, we're going to have to take a break, but okay. we'll, we'll be coming back. We're going to discuss it further. Let me just say that I have said often that I will not trip anybody who's moving in the same direction I am, and I don't believe this is a step in the same direction. I don't believe this is a step towards more liberty. I don't believe it is a step in the right direction. We have been talking with Al in New Mexico about the national sales tax that's being suggested by a lot of people, libertarians, Republicans, and others. We have a $2 trillion government, and that's going to be financed one way or another. And to think that we can have a national sales tax that will be small enough to be palatable to most people is, I think, a great mistake. They talk about a 15% sales tax, but as soon as... I, I, go ahead. I, I heard it was 23, actually. Well, and the Cato Institute is honest enough to say it'll be more like 30%, because right. once the politicians start discussing it, they are going to exempt the poor, they're going to exempt all their uh, the industries of their favorite backers, and that means that the rest of us, to cover the amount of money that's currently being paid in income tax, are going to have to cough up 30 or 35 percent. And as I said, the Cato Institute is realistic enough to recognize that they still support it. Uh, and people say, well, if, once people are paying so much, they'll realize government is too big and they'll start voting for smaller government. Well, that might be true, except you will never get a 30 percent sales tax through Congress because it will be politically unpalatable, and everybody will hate the politicians who voted for it. And the result will be that there will be a lot of sound and fury and a lot of people working very hard to make this happen, but it will never happen. It would be easier to get Congress to repeal the income tax and reduce government than it would be to get a 30% sales tax through Congress. Really? Think so? Okay. I, I think so. I think that, that it, I'm not telling you we will. I'm saying that it is possible to build the, the public opinion necessary to make this happen. It's not going to happen overnight. And because we won't have some big uh, billionaire backer of the idea of the sales tax or something of that sort, it's not going to get the prominence in the near future. But since that isn't going to happen anyway, I think we should look to the long term and just do everything we can to build the public opinion to create what it is we really want, which is to reduce government. Al, thanks for your call. I'm sorry. That's it for tonight. If you want to talk about it further, just call back next week earlier in the show. Show. Thanks so much for tuning in tonight, and I hope you'll come back again next Saturday night. Meanwhile, this week, do as I always urge you to do. Do something nice for yourself and your family. Don't let this get you down. You still have a life to live, and you still have a glorious opportunity to live it well, so don't pass it up. This is Harry Brown. Thanks so much for listening. Good night. Good night.